Welcome everyone to this course on software product lines. This course is a master's level course and uh, the idea is to introduce how to model, implement and analyze software product lines. Software product lines are known under many different names such as software variability, configurable software uh, or mass customization. So the idea of this course it is to give an overview, especially on the implementation of such software product lines. There are many techniques out there and you will learn which ones to choose and why. This course uh, is actually joint work together with Timo Kera from the University of Bern and uh, Elias Küter from the University of Magdeburg. And with both of them, uh, we started to work on this course, designing this course from scratch in 2021. And the first version of this course was actually given in 2022. And this is the first recording of this course. So to give you an overview, so this uh, is a whole lecture series. Uh, so supposed to be given as uh, a university, as a university course. And the idea is that we split this up into several parts. So in the first part, in the first three lectures, we will talk about ad hoc approaches to variability. So what can you do? What do people do typically if they don't know anything about software product lines? In the second part, we will look more into detail, and this is the core part of the lecture, how to model the valid combinations of features, but also how to implement software product lines. And in the last part, we will talk about quality assurance, how to ensure that the quality uh, is, uh, yeah, reach, reaches uh, a sufficient level. And we also give some uh, outlook on other topics like evolution and maintenance. So today, this lecture uh, will be uh, the introductory lecture. And um, in this lecture, uh, we will give uh, three parts. Uh, we will have three parts uh, introduced in software product lines. Uh, first, we will give some definitions of what is actually a product line. We will see a lot of examples. In the second part, I would like to give you a brief overview on the main challenges of software product lines. So we will look into six challenges that we will see over and over again in the next lectures also in more detail, but that guide uh, can probably motivate you uh, to uh, follow this course. And in the last part, we will give some more details on, on this course, on the organization of this course, uh, but also more organizational details for certain universities. So let's go dive into the topic uh, immediately. And uh, I do have a couple of examples here. I would like to look at these examples and see what they have in common. So maybe it's not that easy for you to see what they have in common um, uh, because they are so from so different areas. Um, uh, there is something about products here, about different kinds of products. Uh, but what they all have in common is the idea of customization. So these shoes are uh, medical shoes uh, that are designed for a particular person that are uh, actually customized for this one person and uh, not a mass product uh, that you can buy in a store. Uh, then we have the Eiffel Tower, which is there's only one such Eiffel Tower. I mean, there are smaller pieces in gift shops, but other than that, uh, it's just the, the original. So it was designed and planned uh, to be one this one uh, monument uh, over there. Uh, when it comes to clothes, uh, there's typically only one point in time when people have customization of clothes, and that's for a wedding, when the wedding dress uh, is actually customized uh, to fit uh, perfectly. And then uh, we see uh, an early uh, bicycle or a kind of bicycle, um, and this bicycle was actually uh, just there's just one piece that was built. It was customized for a particular person. Uh, it cannot even be ride. Uh, people uh, with a different size, for instance, cannot ride this bicycle. So what these examples have uh, in common is that we have a labor intensive production. We have highly individual goals. 
We see uh, customization also in other examples. So this is uh, one example of uh, an elevator. So an elevator might have from the outside, right? Before you get into the elevator, you might have two buttons to press. You might have one button to press and you cannot decide which direction. Uh, you might also have some visual feedback uh, when it is pressed. Um, we might have a keyhole uh, indicating that there are certain floors that are otherwise not reachable without a key, or you might even have a floor display giving you more details on the floors. So these elevators are not only customized for particular uh, situations from the outside, but also from the inside. So uh, for instance, in this elevator, uh, there's no button to actually close the doors. And uh, there are some rumors that uh, even if there's a button to close the doors, uh, it's probably not doing anything. Um, here we have an example where we have two key keyholes. So there are probably two different security levels or two different levels that cannot be reached uh, by means of this elevator. Or we have a key card. So that's a very frequent example that you would see in hotels. Uh, or we might have a very useful feature actually. So once you press, uh, and activate a certain floor, you can deactivate it by uh, uh, doing an, a double click basically, right? So by uh, pressing the button uh, twice afterwards. Uh, so make sure that you, uh, before you do this, what I did in this elevator to check that this feature is actually available. On the other hand, in contrast to customization, we have mass production. So the idea of mass production is that we produce goods from standardized parts. And it's actually a consequence of industrialization. Uh, the idea and the goal was to improve the productivity uh, with respect to like handcrafting or customization. So we have reduced costs, we have improved quality. So where does the improved quality comes from is that we have standardized parts. So companies uh, can build these standardized components and focus on these components only. Uh, but we have almost no individualism in mass production. So um, the principle behind mass production is uh, one size fits all. So we see this for t-shirts. So there are different sizes for t-shirts, but uh, besides those different levels, uh, there's no other uh, size, right? And if you do not fit into the regular size of like human, then you probably have a problem. You have to see which which t-shirt size actually fits you best, but there might not be a perfect one as for the wedding, uh, wedding uh, dress. Uh, so this is also known as a Swiss army knife, right? So the knife that can basically do everything, right? So that has all the tools that you need to survive. Uh, and in German, we also have uh, this cute animal over here. It's uh, an Eierlegende Wollmilchsau. And this animal is supposed to give you all the things that you need and you don't need uh, a cow for milk uh, separately and, uh, and a pig and, uh, and so on, but you have all in one animal. And it's basically an analogy for something, for a product that actually fulfills many different requirements um, and tries to overcome uh, all problems of individual uh, products. Here I have a, a quote that I would like you to read. So this quote is by um, is written in a book by uh, Sven Apel and others. And in their book on software product lines, they give this uh, more more or less subjective uh, uh, idea of that. Like uh, we typically have like buggy software uh, when it comes to office software, for instance. And uh, but still, um, uh, there are uh, things in there like uh, that software is complex, that it is slow, that it is buggy, that we see all over the place. And when it comes to like safety critical software, when it comes to embedded systems, when it comes to mission critical software, then the question is, can we do better than this mass production, which basically is a Swiss army knife in most cases, which tries to uh, uh, get around with every possible requirement and making things more complicated than they are in reality. 
So now when it comes to cars, uh, they're actually kind of mass produced, right? So there are many cars out there that are produced um, uh, comparably uh, low prices uh, compared to what is actually needed to build a car, right? So a single person cannot build a car and even like if you have a hundred people, they, they cannot build a car. Um, and uh, but the interesting insight from the automotive industry, and we've heard this several from several companies, is that about every second car is unique. So actually, it's not really mass production here, but it's a mixture of mass production and customization. And that's what is known as mass customization. So the idea of mass customization is to combine uh, the advantages of mass, custom, uh, mass production with that of customization. So the idea is that we produce customized in individual goals, uh, goods, but at a cost that is similar to mass production. We will not have the identical uh, price as for mass production because of this variability, because of this configurability. And we see one example here. So we've seen cars before, but this is another view. This is kind of the view before it's produced. You can configure your car. So this is the Toyota configuration and you can choose your wheels and you can also choose uh, the small dot that is in the middle of the wheel. So we have really fine-grained um, customization going on for cars. Uh, but of course, this needs to be also um, realized, right? So this is kind of the marketing perspective, but this also needs to be realized technically. And this is uh, like uh, fundamental to car production, uh, this customization. So at every single step, customization is going on and uh, mostly the cars are not identical that leave uh, the factory. So actually in the lecture, uh, we will also look at this configuration perspective, but also on this production, but then more on software. But there are many domains where mass customization is actually applied, like you can configure your bike, computer, some electronics, even like tools, uh, med medical um, tools, uh, clothing, food, uh, or even financial services. But the question is, how about software, right? So we want to talk about software product lines in this course. Uh, so when it comes to mass customization, let's first look on uh, what does customization mean for software. And this is actually the standard uh, process of developing software. So when we, it comes to waterfall model, V model, uh, Scrum or other techniques, then you typically producing software that is customized for a particular customer. So you can use this, you can use this from scratch for every customer, but of course this will not scale very, very well. Then we have mass produ uh, production, and we can use the, the same techniques like waterfall uh, model or Scrum for this, um, where standard software is developed once for millions or even billions of users. So uh, one of the uh, mobile apps that is most installed on devices, uh, I mean, manually installed by humans, uh, is, uh, for instance, the WhatsApp messages. There are other uh, apps out there. And it's interesting that like already uh, about half of the people on the world are actually using certain apps in uh, the Android marks market space. Then we have mass customization. And when it comes to software, we will talk about software product lines, right? So, so this is the more common term. If you look into other areas than software, then it's uh, more often called mass customization. Uh, or product line, but here we will talk about software. So why do we want to have software product lines? We might have resource limitations, right? So if you think of embedded systems, like in these cars, we have a lot of embedded systems, ECUs, that have strict limitations on memory performance, on energy consumption. Uh, we might even have different hardware, and this hardware obviously comes from the differences in the cars itself. Uh, but we also have uh, differences in, in other domains, uh, like sensor networks or something like this. We might have different hardware that we want to support, depending on the resource co consumption of the software. We might have different laws. So if you configure a car, it typically depends on the country in which you uh, configure the car, what kind of car is actually delivered to you. And it might be uh, the same hardware, but different software used, or it might be uh, the same software, but a different hardware used. So there are differences uh, depending on the laws in the different countries. 
And the overall goal of software product clients is to avoid expensive customization. So we do not want to start from scratch again for different customers. And the question is, how is such software developed? And the question is, how is software developed in general? And I would like to uh, point you to the project cartoon first. Um, uh, this is uh, the project cartoon is something that every software engineer should know about. Uh, and as software is actually hard to visualize, uh, we will look at these uh, these uh, swings. So first of all, we have the vision of the customer. So the customer explains the swing he wants, right? So this looks a bit weird, like uh, you've probably seen other swings out there. And then we have the project manager. So the project manager understands something about the swing, but probably not everything correctly and not everything how the customer intended it. And then we have the analyst, right? So that they start to design the software, they start to think about this, and then they will find out, okay, this swing can actually not move, right? So we need to change this, uh, even if it's uh, not very happy for the tree in this case. And then we have an implementation. The implementation probably has other drawbacks, uh, maybe also uh, with respect to uh, uh, functional uh, uh, working. Then we have uh, what the beta testers received, uh, then we have how it is supported, the software. And in the end, there's actually a product that the customer actually needed, right? So it's not necessarily the same as the customer uh, envisioned in the first place, because even the customer learns during the process, uh, during software development. So what you can see from this picture, this is actually about requirements and about the final product, about the ideal product, right? So if the software project fails, then the product will probably not look like this. But if the project is successful, then it will look like this. And all the steps in between are actually known as the software lifecycle, right? So we have analysis, design, implementation, testing, and maintenance. And why I need to tell you all this is we want to talk about software product lines and how they fit into this whole process, how they fit into the software lifecycle. And before we can define a software product line, we need to define what is a feature. So I have one example here for you. This is an XKCD, and I will give you some time to have a look at the image. So of course, this is like a bit exaggerated of the situation that we have out there. But uh, over the last like 30 years, uh, the printers were getting more and more features and probably also many features that not many people use out there, right? So uh, most people are fine if they can, can print out something and don't need all the other features. Um, and of course, uh, this already indicates this example that there might be some features that are not useful together, right? So why to notarize a document if you throw it into the trash anyway? So this is one example, like printer product lines and printers. We have features like printing, copy, fax, uh, which is uh, probably no one else in the, in the world is using it uh, except people in Germany. Um, what is a feature? A feature is a characteristic or end user visible behavior of a software system. So for this printer, in this visualization, we even see the features by these small uh, icons uh, on, on front of the printer. Of course, this visibility of the behavior might be more subtle for a certain product. So we might need to play around with a product. So for instance, for the elevator I've shown you, you need to actually interact with it to see whether a double click is supported in the elevator to deactivate a selection. So what is a feature in a product line? I will give you some time to read this definition. So in, in this definition, we see that features, uh, in addition to what a feature means for software at all, right? so even if we just have one printer, it might have certain software features. A feature in a product line has a particular meaning. 
a particular additional meaning to a feature in general. And a feature is actually used to uh, understand, to communicate what are the differences between different products of a product line. And this communication is uh, done by different stakeholders, so the people that are involved in the software process, but also users of the later software. And the interesting part, which brings us back to the software lifecycle, is that features are actually used to guide you through this whole software lifecycle. So imagine that there's a certain bug in with a certain feature, right? So it might be a new feature, so it might be buggy. We need to find that implementation of the feature, then we need to test it, uh, or we might need to maintain it later on. And you see this is uh, crossing uh, uh, through the whole life cycle, and we need to think about features in terms of features when developing these product lines. So what is a product? Let's look at it from another perspective. A product of a product line is specified by a valid feature selection, which is a subset of the features uh, of the product line. And a feature election, uh, selection is valid if and only fulfills all feature dependencies. So not all the features are, uh, can be combined in practice, right? So we had, have some features which cannot be uh, used together. So in the elevator example, we've had um, either you have like two uh, buttons to, you, that you can press or you have one button, but you cannot have like one and two buttons at the same time. So some uh, note on terminology uh, that we use in this course. So in this course, we will basically use uh, the terms synonymously uh, product, product variant and variant. Uh, a software product is a product that consists uh, only of software or uh, um, uh, a certain amount of software at least. And software is actually more than a program, right? The software can also consist of requirements, models, the design documents, uh, the actual source code, which is also different from the program. We might have some tests or documentation. So software is more than a program, uh, but still in this course, we will mostly focus on how to implement uh, the source code uh, to understand how to make those uh, product lines uh, and these ideas work. So we have one example here. Uh, this is a product map uh, that you can see at the Eclipse website. Eclipse is an IDE for an integrated development environment for developing software. Uh, you probably all know integrated uh, development environments. So Eclipse is just one of many others like IntelliJ, NetBeans, uh, and others, Visual Studio. And uh, we can see here in this uh, product map that we have certain products and we have certain features and you see that certain features are actually uh, in some of the uh, products and not in others right so for instance the java development tools are in uh, uh, the uh, jdt version but they're not in the cdt version of eclipse so what we can see here in these columns are products. Products are actually distinguished by means of a selection of the features. And in some later lectures, we will also distinguish between the features that are selected and what needs to be done to realize that product. So when it comes to software product lines, we typically have to think of a domain. So a domain is an area of knowledge that is scoped to maximize the satisfaction of the requirements of its stakeholders. What does it mean? It means that you cannot build a product line out of products that are very different from each other. So it wouldn't make sense to have a product line of a car and a printer and an integrated development environment. Right? You will not have much reuse uh, among those very different products. Uh, so the idea of a domain is to think about what is the area of expertise that you have in a company or in a uh, software community, and then to scope this and think of what is in scope. So what is this product really for and what is not in scope? So the domain is not only about like these economical uh, ideas of like how to scope, how to which requirements are in the domain and which not, but it's also about concepts and terminology to understand uh, this domain. So 
practitioners in that area will actually need certain vocabulary, certain notations to understand this domain and uh, to also communicate with each other which features are in there and so on. And it includes some knowledge how to build software systems or parts of software systems in that area. So a domain is actually more than just like uh, a set of requirements that uh, could be fulfilled, uh, but it's actually also about uh, the knowledge how to build successful products for cars or for printers or for uh, uh, integrated development environments, but probably not experts that will do all of them. So now we come to features of a domain, right? So we talked about features in general, software features, about features in a product line. And of course, a domain has also features and a feature is basically a domain abstraction. So when I tell you that uh, there are printers that can copy and others that cannot copy or some that can scan, then you already have a rough idea, even though not all of you are uh, professional developers of printers, right? So this is a domain abstraction. I will give you just a brief uh, phrase or something like this, or a couple of words, and you have some imagination of what is going on, what, what is behind this domain abstraction. The identification of features in a domain, of course, requires a lot of domain expertise. So no one will be able to like produce printers that has never produced printers before, uh, just and think about the features. So it requires a lot of domain expertise to identify what are the relevant features. And later we will also see how to select features from a domain for a particular product line. So now we can come to a definition of a software product line. I will give you a short moment to read this definition. So the definition looks quite heavy when you look at the, or read it for the first time, but we will actually go, I will guide you through this. A software product line is a set of software intensive systems. So why don't we say uh, software product line is a set of products or software products? Because it might be that these systems are actually not only of made of software, but there might be also some hardware, uh, but at least they are software intensive, right? So the software is actually uh, playing a major role during the production of these systems. And we will also name these or simplified uh, uh, terms uh, for these software intensive systems. We call them products or variants. These products share a common managed set of features. And uh, while we have these features, right? So we make a selection of features from a domain. It doesn't mean that every product has all the features, but this common means that there's a set of features that is common to the product line, and there are certain products that share those features. And the set will also be managed, but we will later on take uh, uh, have a certain lecture uh, on how to manage this set of feature. We want to satisfy the specific needs of a particular market segment or mission, and this is about the domain, right? So uh, the domain gives you more information about what is what is actually the market segment uh, that you are addressing with these products where you want to earn money or uh, develop software for free if it's open source. And uh, these uh, products uh, are also developed from a common set of core assets and in a way that is actually predefined, right? So uh, we are not uh, taking core assets uh, together in an ad hoc manner, but rather in a pre-described way, you envision how these core assets will be used later on. And this is about planned structured reuse. And we will also see about different flavors of this kind of reuse and some that are more uh, unstructured, for instance. So this gives us uh, the last slide in this video. Uh, this is uh, a definition for product line engineering. Software product line engineering is a paradigm to develop software applications, software intensive systems and software products using software platforms and mass customization. And the promises that we have from software product lines are we have tailor-made products, we have reduced costs, we have improved quality because parts are actually reused across products, and we have a reduced time to market. So 
uh, if you think of like uh, the car example, if you would order a car and it would take five years to develop it, you're probably not interested in this car anymore after five years. So we also want to reduce the time uh, to develop these cars. And to understand the idea uh, more closely, it's uh, basically about uh, the number of products that we have in the system. Uh, so for certain uh, areas, uh, or the idea is once you are in single system development, you will have a certain effort when developing uh, these, uh, these systems. And the idea is we want to have a reduced effort at some point in time. But what we need for, uh, to make this work is we have some upfront investment. And at a certain point in time, these uh, development of a product line may actually be worse. And of course, this varies across different uh, products that you have about their commonalities and differences. Um, and it could also be feasible that in certain uh, cases, a product line is already feasible for two products, uh, but certainly not for one product. So then we have single system engineering, and this is about the classical software development that is considered as uh, product line engineering, that is not considered as product line engineering, right? When we build a single product and do not think about other products at the same time. So sometimes we need this term to distinguish uh, product line engineering from uh, other uh, uh, engineering methods. So to wrap up this part of the lecture, uh, we've learned that mass customization is actually a combination of mass production and customization. Uh, we have defined and given examples for features, products, and domains. Uh, we define the term software product line, which actually incorporates features and products and domains, and how these are actually developed uh, with structured reuse. And product en engineering is uh, the uh, more of an engineering method behind software product lines. There's some further readings. We have some literature pointers, uh, for instance, in the book by uh, Sven Apple and others. And now you could uh, take some time uh, to think about further examples. What are examples of product lines that you know of? Uh, and think about what is a feature in that product line? What is a product? What is a domain? Uh, what is the difference between domain and product line? And then you could think of whether these product lines are actually, do they have a relation to software or not? And then you can come back uh, for the next part of the lecture. See you later.